2.0's um, latest main line book, I guess you would say. It is a book on the occult. So, scroll down here. Um, yeah, cryptids, secret societies, deviant abilities, mirrors and imposters, cults, curses and packs, time-related stuff, mindscapes or psychic duels, and uh, so forth. And two new classes, the psychic and the um, Thaumaturge. And today, I'm going to go over the Psychic Thaumaturge. Maybe get to some of the archetypes that are later in the book. So, yeah. Uh, starting out, we have the Psychic. So, the little blurb on the class. Guided by... The personal combination of their subconscious and conscious mind, a psychic calls forth occult magic with but a thought. The psychic focuses more on the moment than on daily spell slots, wielding unique, versatile cantrips and unleashing their mind to use strange and powerful abilities. So, psychic. It's a psychic. It does mind magic. So, it's big difference between this and, say, a sorcerer, the other spontaneous caster is the sorcerer has more spells per day has more spell slots the psychic has fewer spell slots uh by one per level by default but the the psychic has these cantrips that they can amp up using focus points so you end up with a class that's a little more like spamming these weaker spells and then they can give them an occasional boost to make them more powerful. Uh, they have some other details we'll go over when we go over the features as to how their casting works. Um, anyway, and unlike the sorcerer, they're locked to occult casting. I really should have compared it more to the bard because the bard kind of has a similar thing, but the bard has the full three spells per day. The bard has their like their performance cantrips or whatever. Um, the the psychic has cantrips, but they're not performative, and they amp them. So, uh, the the details for the class, your key ability score can be either intelligence or charisma. At first level, you choose a subconscious mind. And that's where you get that um, uh, main stat from. You have six plus your con mod hit points each level. So very much on the low end. You are a caster, so you're super squishy. You start trained in perception. You start trained in fortitude and reflex, and you're an expert in will. And the psychic ends up actually with not the best will saves. That's the Thaumaturge, funnily enough. They sort of have a scaling on their will saves better than a wizard. So really good at will willpower. Um, you're trained in occultism and a number of additional skills equal to three plus your int mod. So you potentially have a lot of skills if you focus on intelligence. Maybe not as much focused on charisma. Uh, that's, I think it's a pretty standard loadout for a caster class for skill points. You're trained in all simple weapons and unarmed attacks. Again, different from the wizard, where the wizard has like four things. You get all your simple weapons in here. Uh, your defenses. You're untrained in all armor, but you're trained in unarmored defense. No armor. Um, you're also trained in your occult spell attack rolls and occult spell DCs, which is, of course, standard for spellcasters. Psychers. I sense heresy. Oh, there's so much heresy in here. It's delicious. Um, so, <laughs> uh, psychic spell casting, you have access to the vast well of power that resides within your own mind, calling forth psychic magic with nothing but thoughts and will. You can cast occult spells using the cast a spell activity. You alter some of the standard spell components when casting spells, you know, from your psychic spell casting. 
Instead of speaking, you substitute any verbal components with a special mental component determined by your subconscious mind class feature. This represents how you exert your mind toward your intended effect. Any of these components impart the concentrate trait to the spell you're casting. You also substitute any material components with somatic components, though these tend to be simple movements of the hand or head compared to those used by other spellcasters. Your spells still have clear and noticeable visual and auditory manifestations as normal for a spellcaster. Each day, you can cast one first level spell. You must know spells to cast them, and you learn them via the spell repertoire class feature. Number of spells you can cast each day is called your spell slots. As you increase a level as a psychic, uh, your spells increase, and it's all typical stuff from there. So uh, I'm not going to go over the basics of spells and spell repertoires. Um, I wanted to read that just because you replace your verbal components with your mind powers and uh, <laughs> your material uh, components with somatic components. So you... You don't need to pull out little things from your spell component pouch. You sort of, you know, woo, 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 and uh, you get your your casting on. So yeah, uh, spell repertoire. You, hey, mage strats. <laughs> uh, yeah, your spell casting is spontaneous. So you have a number of spells per day, right? Uh, spell slots per day. And then your spells known more or less is equal to your spell slots per day. Um, there are there are additional spells you learn as you as you go, but for the most part, um, you'll have a couple spells per level that you can fill into those slots. You don't like a wizard would be like, I have three spell slots. I'll put in jump, true strike, and feather fall, right? And you have one cast of each of those. So this is like, oh, I have true strike and feather fall. And then I can cast each of those once per day or one of them twice per day. Um, so spontaneous casting. Um, it's interesting that you can do it off of intelligence. Because typically spontaneous casters are like charisma based, which this class can choose charisma. But you can also do spontaneous int casting, which is actually pretty neat. It's I'm trying to think if that's actually been a thing before. I think it was in first edition. Because in second edition, your spontaneous casters are like Bard, which is Charisma, Sorcerer, Charisma, Oracle, Charisma. And you're like prepared casters, there's like Cleric is Wisdom, Druid is Wisdom, Wizard is Wisdom, Witch is Wisdom, or is uh, Intelligence. Uh, Witch is Intelligence, Mage is Intelligence. Oh, yeah, Summoner, I think, is spontaneous, and they're charisma-based. There probably was a class that did spontaneous casting off of a not-charisma stat. Like the Occultist or something. All right, so the big feature here, side cantrips and amps. The magic of your mind manifests as psi cantrips, which you can modify by spending focus points. Like other cantrips, you can cast psi cantrips as often as you like, and they are automatically heightened to half your level rounded up. Your psi cantrips are an addition to the cantrips you choose from the occult list as part of your psychic spellcasting. Generally, only feats can give you more Psy cantrips. Unlike other cantrips, you can't swap out Psy cantrips gained from psychic feats at later levels. At a, le at a later level. Unless you swap out that specific feat via retraining. At first level, you learn three Psy cantrips determined by your choice of conscious mind. One is a unique Psy cantrip, and two are common cantrips, typically from the occult spellcasting tradition that you always cast as Psy cantrips. You automatically gain more psychic cantrips as you progress in your career as a psychic. You start with a focus pool of two focus points. However, unlike spellcasters, you don't gain focus spells that cost focus points to cast. Instead, you use your focus points to boost or modify your psychic cantrips by applying 
AMPs, specialized thought forms that alter the expression of your psychic power. Each of your side cantrips has a special AMP heading. Whenever you cast a side cantrip, you can AMP it by spending one focus point to add the AMP effect. You can also gain additional AMPs through feats, allowing you to substitute a side cantrip's normal AMP effect for another one. You choose which AMP to use if you choose to use any each time you cast a Psy Cantrip. Unless otherwise noted, you can apply only one AMP to a given Psy Cantrip. You refill your focus pool during your daily preparations, and you can regain focus points by spending 10 minutes using the refocus activity to explore your mind... Okay, I'll stop doing that. Mind, whether via meditation, practicing a craft or activity that gives you the mental space to self-reflect, or talking through your thoughts and feelings with yourself or another. If you spent focus points only to amp psi cantrips or fuel psychic abilities, since the last time you refocused, you regain two focus points when you refocus, up to a maximum of two. If you've spent focus points on focus spells or abilities other than those from the psychic class, for instance, to cast a focus spell you gained from an archetype, you regain only one focus point. So, it's awesome to start with multiple focus points, because focus spells are awesome. And... I, I love the idea of the amped cantrips. So you get your, your three cantrips, and then you can amp them. Uh, we'll go over the specific cantrips when we get to it, but um, some of them are really cool and fun. Um, and it's neat that you can actually refocus your two points out of the gate too, provided you're not using those to, like, I don't know, if you picked up a Magus spell or something, or an Oracle spell, or whatever, that... Yeah, you, you can basically keep your pool of focus points very full to keep your abilities going. So, Unleash Psyche. When one thins the barrier between their inner mind and the outer world, one can unleash true psychic power. However, the mind wasn't meant to tap its full strength for long, leading to backlash once your Unleash Psyche ends. So, Unleash Psyche. Free action. Your turn begins, you're in an encounter, you cast a spell on your previous turn, and you aren't stupefied. You call in the depths of your mind and let psychic power flood through. Your psyche remains unleashed for two rounds or until you fall unconscious, whichever comes first. You can't voluntarily quell your unleashed psyche. While your psyche is unleashed, the following effects occur. You're constantly surrounded by the visual manifestation of your psychic magic. You, when you cast a damaging spell, you gain a status bonus to its damage equal to double the spell's level. This applies only to spells that don't have a duration and you cast using psychic spellcasting. You can use actions that have the psyche trait. After you've unleashed your psyche, after your unleashed psyche subsides, your mind must recover from the strain of channeling its full power. You can't use unleashed psyche again for two rounds and you're stupefied one for two rounds. Basically, basically you amp up your brain in this case, and you can do more damage with your spells. Uh, it doesn't actually affect your cantrips, because cantrips have a big old zero as their spell level. Wait. Mm, no, cantrips have a level, don't they? Because they heighten. I said, what if I cantrips? Whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, uh... Yeah. Yeah, I think I got that right. So, um, before we jump over to the subconscious mind, we'll go over this uh, key terms here because this is going to help a little bit with future stuff. And the other thing I was going to note, um, there are actions that have the psyche trait. They are going to be feats, and you can only use those while your, your brain is at full power. So, um, key terms, amp, Amps are special thought forms that modify the properties of your psi cantrips. You can only apply you can apply an amp only to a psi cantrip, which is called the amped cantrip. Applying an amp to a psi cantrip costs one focus point as part of the actions needed to cast the spell. The singular focus requires to amp a psi cantrip means that unless otherwise noted, you can only you can you know I <laughs> I'm reading that as uh, you can only apply one. Same same thing. You can apply only one amp to a given psi cantrip. 
And you can't apply both an amp and a meta magic ability to a cantrip at the same time. If both an amp and the amp cantrip deal damage of the same type, combine their damage for the purposes of resistances and weaknesses. Uh, feats with the amp trait provide different amps. You can apply to side cantrips in place of their normal amps. Um, if you amp, if an amp has its own effect, its level here. I'm going to zoom in a little too. There we go. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to read like the tiniest text at a distance. So I wanted to keep as much of the page on the screen as possible because I, I prefer if I'm watching a video to have like the page a little more visible. But anyways, yeah. Um, basically giving you a little details on how an amp works. Amp heightened. Many amps have heightened entries similar to spells. Uh, add the amps heightened effects when you cast the cantrip at that level or higher. These are in addition to any heightened effects of the cantrip, though some adjust the cantrip's normal heightened entry, typically in case of damage increases. So your cantrips heighten as you go, your amps heighten as you go. Hey, Pikachu song. So mind shift, an action with this trait can always be altered to use the raw power of your mind. Um, when you take this action, you can choose to replace any damage. It deals with mental damage. Give it the mental trait and replace any save it requires with a will save. The action loses any traits matching the damage types. It no longer deals. Um, and then Psyche. Your Psyche must be unleashed to use the abilities that have the Psyche trait. In the end, automatically, when your Unleashed Psyche subsides. So that's a little that's a little rules refresher on some of the key terms for this class. Amp, camp, damp, ramp, lamp, clamp. Damp. Another word for that is moist. Keep that meme going. So, subconscious mind. The psychic's power is born in the depths of their psyche, far from the surface. Your subconscious mind might represent the, the way your power comes to you naturally. Or it might be a framework you use to safely access the infinite potential of your mind. Either way, your subconscious mind fundamentally shapes how you access and wield psychic magic. Choose a subconscious mind from the options starting on page 15, or options from other sources to which you have access. This choice will determine your key ability, special spellcasting components you use, and an action you can take while you have unleashed your psyche. The following options are presented in this book. Emotional acceptance. Throwing yourself headlong into your emotions is what lets you access your power. Gather lore. Tutors taught you specific axioms and lessons to help you access your mind. Precise discipline. Meticulously aligning your thoughts brings your mental power into reality. Wandering reverie. Your imagination fuels your magic through instinct and free association. Uh, full Jedi mind tricks. You know... Yeah, you can do Jedi mind tricks. I was going to say... You can technically get a lightsaber made out of your mind powers now if you wanted to. I was thinking of going over that today, but it's something that we'd be doing at the very end of the the stream after going through two whole classes, so we'll see. <laughs> um, and lastly, we have the conscious mind. Um, whatever the subconscious source of your psychic of a psychic's power, all find that a specific external manifestation of their magic comes most easily to them. This conscious outward expression adds several additional spells to your spell repertoire and grants you three psi cantrips. Two of these cantrips are common spells, though you gain an extra benefit with them that other spellcasters don't get. The last is unique to your conscious mind. You also get two more unique psi cantrips at higher levels. Choose a conscious mind, starting from the options... Uh, on page 16, or options from other sources for which you have access. The following options are presented in this book. The Distant Grasp. Manipulate psychic objects with telekinesis. The Infinite Eye. Observe the world and weaponize your knowledge. The Oscillating Wave. Redistribute thermal energy to create blazing heat and bone-chilling cold. The Silent Whisper. Tap into the thoughts of those around you to soothe or influence. The tangible dream. Weave your imagination into creations of force and light. 
and the Unbound Step, Bend and Traverse Space with Teleportation and Phasing. Uh-oh, Mage. Mage is putting out that there are one of those evil charisma users. Um, my, my favorite is, uh, the tangible dream, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Um, see, I'm one of those stuffy int users, very specifically the magus, and that's why I like tangible dream, but we'll get to that. Um, so for the rest of the class, it's your standard loadout of feats at second level and every even level thereafter. Skill feats, same thing. General feats at three and then every four. Signature spells um, are gained at three because you're a um, spontaneous caster. I've said that like three times, four times already. Uh, and it's like, the word just slipped my mind. Um, you get your skill increases at three and then every two. Ability boosts at five, 10, 15, 20. Ancestry feats at five and then every four. Um... At 5th level, you get a, another focus point, which is awesome. Uh, you get your Reflex to Expert at 5. Expert Spell Casting at 7th. You get your Fortitude Boost at 9. Perception goes up to Expert at 11. So you have, you have low-end Perception growth. Uh, your Willpower goes up to Master at 11. Get your weapon expertise at 11. So you have your lower spellcaster weapon expertises. Uh, unarmor defense gets up to expert at 13. Weapon spec at 13. Master spellcasting at 15. Legendary will at 17. And then 10th level spell slots at 19. Legendary casting at 19. Fairly standard, fairly standard loadout. No really, truly unique things in there. It's a spellcaster's leveling uh, framework. So let's see. Make sure it's on screen. All right, subconscious mind. So you choose your subconscious mind at character creation. Depending on what you choose, you get either int or charisma as your um, key stat. And you get an ability out of this as well. So emotional acceptance. The mind's truths come not in learned words or mathematical formulas, but in deeper feelings and sensations. Emotions unlock the door to your power. You might consider your heart the source of your strength, or you might find the infinite complexity felt in the moment of, in a moment expresses your power more efficiently than any string of mystical words ever could. Your thought components are emotions. You might summon the sense of freedom to buoy you through the air, or let fear grip your heart even as you plant it in another's mind. Emotion components tend to impart abstract or vivid effects to your visual and auditory spell manifestations, as well as more intangible flashes of emotion, such as swirls of joyous color or a sense of growing melancholy. You charisma cast, and you get restore the mind. For one action, you un your unleashed psyche gives your gives you closer connections to the emotions of your allies, letting project reassurance and strength that replenishes their mind and body. Choose one of the two benefits to grant one ally within 30 feet that you can see. That ally is then temporarily immune for 10 minutes. The ally gains a plus one status bonus to saving throws against mental effects until your psyche ends. The ally gains hit points equal, regains hit points, excuse me, equal to two plus double your level. Interesting. I didn't think the psychic would get like straight up healing. I actually haven't read this chunk yet, so I'm probably gonna stumble over some of the sentences. Um, but yeah, so when you unleash your psyche during that, you can spend an action to heal an ally with your emotions. Provided right you're this psychic, because remember, you you get one of the four of these and basically can't get any of the others. I think. Hmm. That delicious kombucha is gone. All right. Um, so, gathered lore. Many psychics are self-taught, uh, frantically improvising how they how to best control their abilities before their power overwhelms them. Not you. 
tutored by a mentor, or classically trained at a facility for psychic development. You've learned techniques and teachings for best harnessing your mind, cataloging each expression of psychic power with specific teaching, anecdote, or phrase. Thanks, Professor X. Your thought components are mantras you associate with a given spell, which you mentally repeat as you cast. You might silently utter a teaching of resilience as you spin force into a barrier or hear the first three notes of a traveling song as you slip through space. Mantra components often produce runes or symbols from your learnings that are unique to each spell you cast, causing your manifestations to resemble those of conventional spellcasters to a much greater degree than those of other psychics. Wolf over kombuched. Uh, a little. I'm going to get more of that stuff. So you're, this is int casting and you get recall the teachings. So one action, the heightened power of your psyche lets you recall every lesson you've ever learned. You search your mind for the right teaching, which comes at first, which at first seems cryptic, but comes into clarity when it's most relevant. Until the start of your next turn, you count as having prepared to aid all allies within 30 feet of you. If you use aid, the aid action, to help one of them during that time, you roll an occultism check for the aid as you recall the lesson to help them. Most lessons take the form of short axioms, parables, or sayings, meaning that conveying them to your ally usually grants your aid reaction the auditory and linguistic traits that's actually really awesome because you're like your brain is unleashed and then you're just like if you go three like you you say some axiom that's about like lock picking or something <laughs> and like your your rogue gets a bonus to their thievery check to pick a lock <laughs> all right uh <laughs> so precise discipline i love just one thing i love that it's um you count as having prepared to aid all allies within 30 feet of you so you're you're just like like you could do this outside of wait do you have to be in, you have to be an encounter to aid another though right yeah you're an encounter okay yeah you can't just do that out of an encounter you have to be an encounter but if someone's like i don't know i'm gonna go trip this guy and you go to aid another them like you would recite a a liturgy to trip a dude <laughs> um and grant a plus two to that i think it is with eight another isn't there a way to get a plus three off of your eight and others i'd have to check anyway uh precise discipline determine determine intended outcome align thoughts identify and resolve distractions manifest Intentional focus is the key to unleashing your abilities, whether that's because your power naturally tends to be precise, discrete effects, or because you've adopted strict discipline to ensure your mind can change the world only when you intend it to. Your thought components are calculations you make to determine the forces you need to call upon. Perhaps you mentally weigh the mass of an object against the force of gravity to levitate it, or you might determine exactly how much energy is needed for an object to combust. Calculation components tend to impart ordered visual and auditory effects to your spells. Manifestation, such as irregular tessellations of light, mathematical spirals, or harmonic tones. Int casting, and you get calculate threats. This is the one I would pick if I were playing a psychic, by the way. Um, calculate threats. Single action, your subconscious automatically calculates vectors and forces. When your mind is unleashed, showing you the likely path of incoming attacks to avoid, you get a plus two circumstance bonus to AC and reflex saves until the beginning of your next turn. You get mind parry. That's mind parry. You can parry stuff with your mind. Which is awesome. Um, I think the only other thing, the only other parry that gets that awesome to me is like, I want to say it's like Magus level 14 has a spell parry. It's the advanced spell parry that basically does that. Um, you get spell parry at two and the other one's at like 14 or something like that. Uh, but yeah, that that's a, a mind parry. And finally, for subconscious mind, we have wandering reverie. The subconscious is by definition buried below the surface. 
Thus, only only by stripping away the clamor and interference of everyday thought can you bring this more fundamental part of your mind to bear. Whether through sleep, self-hypnosis, or special exercises to empty your mind, you found a way to access deeper, more chaotic, a deeper, more chaotic state of free association that better channels your psychic power. Your thought components come from your imagination, images, and sensations your mind freely associates. You might have a passing daydream of small creatures bringing you an object as you telekinetically attract it, or you may blink to find you teleported to your desired location. Spell manifestations from imagination components have surreal or indistinct qualities, and the exact details fade quickly from the observer's memory as sensations from a dream. So this is the other charisma caster. You get fade in the dreams. So single action. Uh, your flights of imagination spill into the real world, causing you to become indistinct, hazy, or cloaked in figments. You become concealed until the start of your next turn. This concealment can't be used to hide as normal for concealing effects that leave your location obvious. So, uh, concealment's like a... I think there's like a... The, if someone tries to attack you, they have to hit a... That to roll like a, a d20 and get like... I think it's above a three five something like that so you get a little little defensive bonus from that you can't use it to hide though um because pe like the people know it's like oh the psychic is semi-translucent and surrounded by projecting fairies he's right over there it's just it's harder to hit them because they're transparent and surrounded by psychically projected fairies um but yeah, uh, still neat though. Um, all of those are neat. I I would go precise discipline. I think if I were playing a psychic, um, but those are fine. They're the abilities are neat, but for the most part, they're not super crazy, over the top awesome. Conscious mind is where it's at. Like honestly, conscious mind. Um, some of these get really awesome. Uh, so with Conscious Mind, you get your Psy Cantrips, some granted spells that are added to your repertoire at those levels, and the amps for your Psy Cantrips. So each one is themed around something. And yeah, we're just going to jump past a little, these are what you get section to just get to Distant Grasp. So Distant Grasp. Motion characterizes the physical. A boulder falls creatures move the world turns you believe the truest form of mind over matter is therefore to move things as well wielding telekinesis is an arm that can grasp the furthest and finest objects so tk mage here uh you're granted spells uh i kinetic ram is new but you get telekinetic maneuver which is great levitate which is handy telekinetic call is handy poltergeist fury and telekinetic bombardment and falling sky are all new and implosion your standard side cantrips are mage hand and telekinetic projectile and your unique side cantrips are telekinetic rend vector screen let me tell you something about vector screen uh <laughs> and dancing blade so yeah mage hand um standard cantrip where you have like a a spectral hand that just lifts and carries things of light bulk uh your mage hand can carry up to one bulk instead of only light bulk. If this spell is heightened at 3rd level or higher, the maximum bulk is 2. If it's heightened to 7th or higher, the maximum bulk is 3. It also gains the following amp. So you get a mage hand that can lift much heavier things. So just by comparison, like a light bulk would be like a wand. A one bulk item would be like a long sword. A two bulk item is a great sword, and I don't even know what a three bulk item is. Um, <laughs> I don't know. There's probably like a cauldron or something that's like three bulk that you could have. So yeah, lift and carry uh, is very strong with mage hand here. Uh, so the amp, you create a multitude of telekinetic hands that grip onto a creature and move it around. Target a creature of medium size or smaller with the amped spell instead of an object. You attempt a sh to shove the target in a direction of your choice. Um, rolling a spell attack roll against its fortitude DC instead of an athletics check. 
Um, the creature takes a minus 10 foot circumstance penalty to its speeds until the spell ends. Starting the round after you cast the spell, the first time you try and you sustain the spell, you can attempt to shove the creature again. So, actually, you know what else this reminds me of? You guys ever play Golden Sun? There's like a mage hand ability you have in that game that can like push things and pull things that's used for the puzzles in it. This reminds me of that quite a bit because mage hand has always been like, you know, I'm going to telekinetically move this pen towards me. <gasps> I did it. This is like, I'm going to lift this uh, person and just throw him against the wall. Like, it's a really awesome way to enhance mage hand. Yeah, mage, it's like, it's probably some sort of like box or cauldron or there might be a pull cart um for that uh oh but yeah uh at fourth level you can do disarms so you can use mage hand for combat maneuvers which is really cool um you can't do though unfortunately grapple which is the or trips like grapples and trips would be so much better than shove and disarm but i think that's probably why you can't do them but but you can do trips with telekinetic maneuver, which you get at second level here. So, yeah, you can still you can still do those with telekinetic maneuver. Oh, you can't grapple, but you can get the trip off with telekinetic maneuver. Um, and the other uh, basic cantrip you get that you can amp is telekinetic projectile. So you increase its range to sixty feet. It's probably thirty feet by default. Gains the following amp. You fling objects with even more force, driving your opponents backwards in a hail of objects. On a success, you push the target away from you 5 feet. On a critical success, you push the target 10 feet away from you, in addition to dealing double damage. That's fine. Here's the real meat and potatoes of this amp. The damage increases by 2d6 instead of 1d6. So, this spell, when you heighten it up, um, the heightened plus 1 is an additional d6 of damage with telekinetic projectile. You amp it up, you're dealing 2d6 damage with this. So you do that default 1d6, and if it's amped, if it's heightened like three times and an amped, you're dealing like 76 damage with a cantrip. By the way, it's not even the strongest cantrip you can get with this class, but that's awesome. <laughs> um, it's awesome for damage, because I think the Psychic might be the best damage dealing spellcaster right now. In terms of its overall damage, it can deal, even though you still got to use spell attack rolls, which aren't the greatest... You still you still can deal a lot of damage with your abilities. All right, so the special cantrip for this um, conscious mind is telekinetic rend. So two actions, sixty foot range, two non overlapping five foot bursts, basic saving throw for fortitude. Um, your mind creates a violent axis of motion in a nearby space. You deal your choice of 1d6 bludgeoning or 1d6 slashing damage to all creatures in the area with a basic fortitude save. A creature large enough to be in more than one of the bursts takes damage only once. And you heightened it plus... This is a little... A little... Eh. It's a plus two heighten, meaning every other level this spell gets heightened, it adds a d6 instead of every level. Um, mm, that's ho-hum. But you get a cantrip that you can just burst two areas with your mind powers. Um, yeah, so the amp, your thoughts expand in power and scope. The bursts deal 1d6 bludgeoning damage and 1d6 slashing damage instead of the usual damage. Creature that critically fails its save is also stunned one. That's sort of where you make up for it, is if you amp it, you double the dice rolls, basically. Um, and an amp plus two, both types of damage increase by 1d6 instead of just one. Uh, at a third non-overlapping five foot burst of the area. So, yeah, the the telekinetic rends base damage. You're better off with your projectile, but the amp damage and amping it, you get another burst. You deal both damage types, so you just like get the spike in damage to like areas. Ain't bad. Now vector screen. This is like. This is where, like, the class goes from, oh, this is really neat, to, man, this is awesome. Okay, so vector screen, two actions, range 60 feet, area one five foot square, duration until the start of your next turn. 
you set up a transparent rippling screen of telekinetic energy that seizes small, fast-moving projectiles. Creatures can pass through the screen, but ammunition from physical ranged attacks, such as arrows, bolts, sling bullets, and other similar-sized objects, is automatically trapped in the screen, clattering to the ground once the spell ends. Attacks with bigger ranged weapons, such as javelins, take a minus two circumstance penalty to their attack rolls if their paths pass through the screen. Massive ranged weapons and spell effects that don't create physical objects pass through the screen, no penalty. So height in the five, the screen is 10 foot. Height in the six, the screen is 10 foot and can interfere even with massless attacks like magical blasts or gouts of flame. Screen imposes a minus two circumstance penalty to the attack rolls for spell effects, even if they don't create a physical object. Um... It also protects against area effects that pass through the screen, granting the standard cover to creatures on the opposite side of the screen from the center or origin point of an area. Um, your amp, your screen persists, persists for longer, and you can detonate it in an explosive counterattack. The duration of the spell increases to one minute. You can dismiss the spell if there are any projectiles trapped in the screen, and you can cast telekinetic projectile to fire them at one creature as part of di dismissing the spell. Measure the range for the telekinetic projectile from where the vector screen was instead of from you. This is where, like, this is where the class goes from, oh, that's neat, to I'm Neo now from the Matrix. And you just hold your hand up and just stop the bullets. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that cantrip, like, when I, when I saw it, I was like, that sounds like neo from the matrix and i'm going and checking the subreddit and people are like and someone posted like you basically become neo from the matrix with this cantrip <laughs> which by the way is a cantrip so you can cast it every turn if you really wanted to so you you get in like a pitched ranged battle and you have a psychic on your team that has this you basically get to stop enemy projectiles from coming at you and if the psychic amps it, they can just throw the projectiles right back. It's like, it's really good. It's just really good, both in terms of what it does, and the flavor is just awesome. Yeah, so uh, the last cantrip that this conscious mind gets, and I'm saying this, this conscious mind because I forgot that it's called Distant Grasp, um, is Dancing Blade. So two actions, range 30 feet, targets one creature, and you can sustain this for up to one minute. You telekinetically animate a weapon that's unintended or on your person. It brandishes itself at a foe of your choice as if you as if wielded by an invisible duelist. When you first cast the spell, the weapon automatically flies to the target and strikes. It moves along with its target, always remaining within reach. <clears throat> Each time you sustain the spell, the weapon either changes partners or strikes. The weapon's attacks use and contribute to your multi-attack penalty. Um, so that's... Uh, uh, first attack is minus zero. Second attack is minus five. Third attack is minus ten. Um, change partners. Uh, change the weapon's target to a different creature within 30 feet. The weapon flies to its new target. Strike. <clears throat> the weapon attacks its target using your spell attack roll. On a hit, the weapon deals damage equal to 2d6 plus your spell casting ability modifier of a type determined by the weapon. Um, if the weapon has the versatile traits or otherwise, or can otherwise deal multiple types of damage, you choose each time you attack. Heightened plus two, damage increases by D6. So again, it's that alternating, like, the damage is, is not going to be boosted as high as your, like, TK projectile. <clears throat> uh, but the amp... The weapon's attacks increase in strength, and your control is fine enough for advanced technique. The Oh, this is where we get the increased damage, though. The damage dice for the weapon strike change from D6s to D10s. Um, when you cast or sustain the spell, you can choose from the following options in addition to the standard ones. You can have the weapon guard um, instead of attack. So the weapon grants a plus two circumstance bonus to the AC against melee attacks to the, creatures, to the creature it's following. Um, the bonus lasts until the start. Wait, rather than tank, the weapon grants a plus two circumstance bonus to AC against melee attacks to the creatures. Oh, right, because you can have it change partners. So what what you would do there is like you assign the partner as an ally and then guard. 
So you basically can have the ally gets a shield for free. Um, bonus lasts until the start of your next turn until the weapon changes partners, whichever comes first. Uh, and you have to push the target uh, with a spell attack instead of athletics, which is pretty not bad, but not... Mm, probably wouldn't pick that, I think, ever. I think striking and guarding is better. Because uh, you can also, you know, push with your mage hand. So yeah, uh, right out of the gate, we have a really cool conscious mind in the form of uh, Distant Grasp. So next up, Infinite Eye. The true strength of the mind lies in the knowledge it contains, with each new observation contributing to the totality of its experiences. To grow your experiences, and with them, your power, you devote yourself to observing as much as possible, casting your senses through space and time with clairvoyance and precognition. So you have True Strike, Augury, Organ Sight, which is in Secret of Magic, Clairvoyance, Prying Eye, True Seeing, True Target, Unrelenting Observation, Foresight. Your standard side cantrips are Detect Magic and Guidance. Your unique side cantrips um, are Glimpse Weakness, Omnidirectional Scan, and Foresee the Path. So the infinite eye is the divination style psychic. So <clears throat> All right. Detect magic. You have the kind of fine control that other spellcasters can only dream of. When you cast detect magic, you're aware of any creature in the emanation affected by a spell or carrying a magic item. And you determine the main location of magic within any magical hazard in the emanation with the normal restrictions on detecting illusions. This typically manifests as an alteration to your vision, such as seeing a soft aura around the creature or hazard. Sensing these phenomena doesn't make it clear which spell is on the creature nor which items are magical. Your detect magic also gains the following amp. Your pulse of detection magic helps you gain a sense of nearby magic strengths and weaknesses. Um, you can detect the presence of magic on an enemy or hazard. You gain a plus one status bonus to saves against magic or originating from that enemy or hazard for three rounds. If you find magic from multiple sources with single casting and detect magic, you get a bonus to, against all of them. Height, uh, the amped heighten at seven increases this bonus to plus two. That's a thing. <laughs> uh, you get a better detect magic that grants you a defensive bonus against magic. Guidance. You have eyes everywhere allowing you to guide people from a greater distance. The range of guidance increases to 120 feet. Gains the following amp. You can project a flash of insight to your ally in the nick of time to save them from failure. Amped guidance doesn't cause a creature to become temporarily immune to guidance, and a creature can be targeted by amped guidance even if it was temporarily immune to guidance. You can cast amped guidance as a reaction triggered when your ally fails or critically fails an attack roll. Perception check, saving throw, or skill check. And the bonus from Guidance um, would change the failure to success, or critical failure to normal failure. Uh, the bonus from Guidance applies retroactively to their check. Uh, amped, at, amped Heighten at 6, the bonus increases to plus 2. That's pretty good, actually. Being able to basically give someone a... Like, oh, our magus is failing a spell strike by 1... Ha ha, it's a success. Or you can save someone from critical failure. That's like a just barely crit fail. Uh, so pretty... Pretty nice, actually. Uh, cantrip one... Uh, first cantrip. <clears throat> we have glim blah, 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 Glimpse Weakness. So, uh, range 60 feet. Target one creature. Duration one minute. You glimpse a loose scale, a seam in the foe's armor, or a similar weakness, aiding your allies in landing a precise hit. The first ally that hits the target with a successful strike deals an additional precision damage equal to 1, plus the spell's level, and then the spell ends. You amp it, it becomes a d4 plus 1, and in heighten every 2, you uh, amped heighten every 2, you uh, increase the additional precision damage by d4 plus 1. Uh, everyone gets a sneak attack, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, it doesn't heighten, though. It amp heightens. So it's always going to be one plus the cantrips level. So two. Um, it, it's not bad. It's free damage. 
that you can cast for free, and it targets a creature. It's one action, lasts a minute, which is not bad. Omnidirectional scan. Uh, one action, 30 foot emanation, targets an ally and an enemy. The duration is still your next turn. Uh, you quickly view your surroundings from a variety of angles. Um, your sense is constructing an overall mental picture. You can choose to seek the entire emanation of the spell. Um, regardless of whether you seek one target ally and one target enemy in the area. Oh, target one ally and one enemy in the area. If the target is concealed or hidden from you, you automatically succeed at the flat check to target it with this spell. You prepare to aid the target ally on an attack roll against the target enemy. If you take this aid action, you use your spell attack modifier and proficiency rank um, on your check to aid. If you critically fail the roll to aid, you get a failure instead. So basically, basically you can give someone mind advice on how to swing a weapon a little better. Uh, the amp, your scans are so minute that you can project your foe's likely strengths and weaknesses. You learn which of the targets, target enemy's saving throws is the highest and which is the lowest. And you and all allies within 30 feet gain a plus one circumstance bonus to attack rolls and damage against the creature. If you take the eight action you prepared for and succeed at your roll, these bonuses increase to plus two on the attack you're aiding and critical success to plus three or to plus four if you have legendary, legendary proficiency in spell attack rolls. That's great for support. That's absolutely, absolutely great for doing supporty stuff with the psychic. Um, like I said, I'm probably going to use the Magus as my example as a battle buddy. So yeah, giving that Magus that plus two, um, uh, plus two to strike and give bonus damage. Pretty not bad. So, 4C, the path. <clears throat> uh, one action, range 60 feet. Targets an ally and an enemy sustained up to a minute. Uh, you see just a split second into the future and glean how an enemy will move, making it easier for your allies to strike it mid-action. Make a perception check against the target enemy's will DC or deception DC, whichever is higher. The GM may judge a different DC is more appropriate if it's higher, for instance, using a target's warfare lore DC of a military captain. Uh, the target is then temporarily immune for one minute. So, if you get a critical success, target ally gains a reaction that lets it make a melee strike against the target enemy, triggered if the enemy leaves a square within the ally's reach. If the ally's already had an ability that lets it make melee strikes as a reaction, such as attack of opportunity, the ally can forgo gaining the temporary action instead to gain a plus two status bonus to melee strikes it makes as reactions. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the success is as a critical critical success, but it's a one. Failure has no effect, so you you basically get there's no problem with you failing this. It's all a bonus. Um. Oh, and if you amp it, same result on failure as a success, but still no effect on critical failure. Each time you sustain the spell, you can choose an additional ally to target, granting them the same benefit. Man. Fighters, ridiculous already, have that psychic friend with you. That attack of opportunity you get at first level just gets even crazier. Alright, I'm going to pour another cup of tea. Give me one quick sec. Yeah, you can hear the occasional throat clear on my part because I am talking a lot. Gotta pull a breather here because we are two in the 
five. And we still got the feats to go over. So yeah, um, oscillating wave. So uh, this is uh, you. You can control hot and cold. So. You listening to you, Hunt Monster? It's totally fine, Mage. Um, was it five? Let me check real quick. It might be six, actually. They put a lot of the one, two, three, four. Oh, it's six. Yeah, they put they put a lot into these um, conscious minds. It might be one more hybrid. Like the Mage just has five hybrid studies, so I think it's kind of maybe typical for six. Um, but yeah, uh, six actually feels like it's a little more given that you also have the subconscious mind stuff, but whatever, whatever, move on. Um, so, uh, oscillating wave, it, it's related to controlling heat and cold. So you're granted spells, you got burning hands, heat metal, fireball, fire shield, cone of cold, flame vortex, fiery body, polar ray, and meteor swarm. Your standard ca your standard psi cantrips are produce flame and ray of frost, and then your unique ones are thermal stasis and tropic wheel and redistribute potential. So, um, conservation of energy. Energy can't be created or destroyed; only transferred or changed. Whenever you use your magic to add or remove energy, you must then balance it with the opposing force. The first time in an encounter you cast a granted spell from your conscious mind or a psi cantrip, decide whether you're adding energy or removing it. Once you add energy, you must remove energy the next time you cast one of these spells. When you refocus, you restore yourself to a neutral state, allowing you to once again freely choose whether you add or remove energy to your or on your next spell. So, adding energy. The ability gains the fire trait. Any damage it deals is fire damage, and any resistance it grants is to cold damage. It loses any traits matching damage types it no longer deals. Conversely, removing energy. The ability gains the cold trait. Any damage it deals is cold damage, and any resistance it grants is to fire damage. It loses any traits matching the types it no longer deals. Fiery Body grants Ray of Frost instead of Produce Flame when cast this way. Mind Shift. When you use an action that has the Mind Shift trait, you can choose to add or remove energy instead of making it mental. Alter it, alter it as normal for adding or removing energy and change any save it requires to a Reflex save. So the core of this one <clears throat> is changing damage types. And you got to change if you do... Heat one turn, add energy, you have to do cold the next turn. Hence, oscillating wave. So, produce flame. Um, when using it as a melee attack, you do D6s instead of D4s. When you amp, you project pure heat that causes a target to combust. The initial damage changes to 1D10 fire damage, not adding your ability modifier, plus 1 fire splash damage. When using Amp to produce flame as a melee attack, increase the damage dice of the initial damage from D10s to D12s. Um, you are not harmed by splash damage from Amp to produce flame. Uh, Amp heightened plus one. Instead of produce flame's normal heightened entry, the initial damage increases by one D10, one D12 for melee. Splash damage increases by one. Persistent fire damage and critical hit increases by D4. That's some big fire damage right there. <laughs> uh, and then Ray of Frost. Um, oh, jeez. The range increases to 180 feet. That's... I, I don't know why you need that. You can already snipe 120 feet with Ray of Frost. Anyways. Um, <clears throat> Amp. You drain the thermal energy at a distance using what you plunder to replenish yourself. The ray deals 1d10 cold damage. You gain temporary hit points equal to half the damage the target takes after applying resistances and the like. You lose any remaining temporary hit points after a minute, and the heightened plus one increases the damage to a d10 instead of d4. That's crazy. Oh, man. Yeah, uh... And 
yeah, with Oscillating Wave, you're like, Ray of Frost, snipe for that cold damage. Next turn, you're like, Ray of Heat, and you hit the fire damage. But yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty neat. So Thermal Stasis, um, single action, range is 60 feet, target one creature, until the start of your next turn. Uh, the same abilities that you raise and lower thermal energy also let you keep it at a safe medium. The, her the target gains resistance 2 against fire and cold damages. You heighten it. Um, each resistance increases by 2 each time you heighten it. The amp increases the duration for a, uh, to a minute. So you get kind of a um, freebie resist energy. Not bad. Uh, entropic wheel reaction trigger. You deal cold or fire damage to an enemy. Duration, one minute. So you stockpile thermal energy and a magical wheel-like construct that lets you burn opponents with cold or freeze their bodies with heat. When you cast the spell, the wheel has one moat of thermal energy. And when you use a cold or fire effect or deal cold or fire damage, the wheel spins, siphoning off a bit of the energy and gaining another moat. The wheel can't gain moats more than once on a given turn, and the maximum number of moats is equal to the entropic wheel's level. When you cast a spell that deals fire damage, the target also takes cold damage equal to the number of moats in the entropic wheel. When you cast a spell that deals cold damage, the target also takes fire damage equal to the number of moats in the entropic wheel. This ability, um, or sorry, this uh, this applies only to the initial damage of the spell, not to any persistent damage or ongoing effects. And when you amp it, you gain two moats instead of one when you cast a spell, and each time the wheel gains another moat. Uh, huh. That's pretty neat, actually. <laughs> that you uh, you basically get this free passive mini game where you have this like wheel of fire and ice that's just gonna build your damage up even higher. I like it. So, uh, redistribute potential. Two actions. Uh, range is 60 feet. Area is two adjacent five foot squares. And there is a basic fortitude save. <coughs> Excuse me. So, energy attempts to balance out. But with your magic, you can shunt all the energy in one area to another. Creatures in either area take four D4 damage with a basic fortitude save. Choose one of the squares to steal heat, dealing cold damage, and the other to concentrate stolen heat, dealing fire damage. A creature that fails its save also becomes clumsy one from numbness if it's in the area of stolen heat, or enfeebled one from heat stroke if it's in the area of concentrated heat. These conditions last until the start of your next turn. Um, if a creature is large enough to be in both, you choose only one of the areas um, for its attempt for the save. It's unaffected by the other area. A heightened increases it by a d4. And then you can amp it. Um, you can affect the flow of energy on a much grander scale. Instead of two 5-foot squares, you create two 10-foot bursts. They must be adjacent to one another and can overlap. Um, a creature in both areas is still only affected by one of your choice. Uh, the spell's damage increases to 66. And the condition lasts for a minute. And then you amp it up or the amp heightened by one and increases by 2d6 instead of 1d4. So, yeah. Big burst damage area. Um, Psychic, so far, uh, is maybe the best blasting mage in the game. Like, after after going through the uh, Distant Grasp in this, it's like, you can just pound enemies with damage. I This one, though, has the typing, so it could be even stronger or even weaker depending on what you're going up against. Okay, Silent Whisper. Um, <clears throat> this is the... What do we got here? Uh, every mind murmurs constantly and the static from those nearby reverberates in your head like wind through leaves. What better focus for your magic then than the very thoughts of those around you? Your versatile telepathic abilities let you soothe and communicate with your allies and control your enemies. So this is like classic telepath stuff. Yeah, mind link, touch of idiocy, ooh, heroism, telepathy, synaptic pulse, sending visions of danger, uncontrollable dance, telepathic demand, 
Standard side cantrips are Daze and Message. Your unique ones are Forbidden Thought, Shatter Mind, and Contagious Idea. Oh, Shatter Mind's probably going to be fun. I haven't read it, but oh, it's probably going to be fun. Um, I kind of skipped Oscillating Wave before when I read this offline and skipped Silent Whisper because I knew Tangible Dream was what I wanted to look at. So yeah, uh, anyways, let's go over it. So, Daze. Um, you can Daze from a great distance. The range increases to 120 feet and gains the following amp. Um, your spell cracks the target's mental defenses, leaving it susceptible to further psychic attack. The spell's damage changes to 1d10. If the target fails its will save until the end of its next turn, it gains weakness 1 to mental damage and takes a minus 1 status penalty to will saves. On a critical failure, the weakness is 3, in addition to being stunned 1. Um, the target applies... Or the weakness applies before days deals damage. So you get more damage off of your days. Um, and then the amped is plus two. You increase the damage by 2d10. And the weakness on the failure or the crit increases by one. Uh, so days turns into like... Like your spellcaster allies get a boost now. Because of the will save reduction. Um, in addition to just like breaking their brain open. Uh, so message is your other one. Your message is not so easily bound by obstacles. The spell can travel up to 120 feet to reach the target. Bending around walls and obstacles. This means you don't need a straight line of effect, a line of sight to cast message. As long as you know the target space and there is an unblocked path of 120 feet or less that can reach them. Gains the following amp. Your telepathic message allows you to coordinate your actions while you pass on information. The target of the message can immediately spend its reaction to step or stride. If you amp it up, the target message can choose to shove, strike, or trip. That's really awesome. <laughs> it's like, hit it. Or wait, it'd be like, and then you see like your, your fire go. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really fun stuff right there. Uh, forbidden thoughts. So, 30 feet, target a creature. Uh, the saving throw is will. You place a psychic lock in the foe's mind that prevents it from a specific action. Choose strike, stride, cast a spell, or a specific action you know that the creature has, such as breath weapon for a dragon. If the creature attempts that action on its next turn, it must surmount your lock to do so. Causing it to take 1d6 mental damage plus your spellcasting ability modifier um, with a basic will save. The target is then temporarily immune for a minute. The heightened is plus one. And if you amp it, your telepathic push is particularly shocking to those who resist it. Target fails to save. It's also stunned one. Uh, that's fun stuff. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I love little little controlly bits like that out of spellcasters where they can just stop something from hitting your team. But also, it's like you get the bonus damage from it, and if you amp it, you can stun them. Uh, actually, that's kind of like a reactive daze, then, isn't it? So it's just another way to to have that that kind of effect happen. But it's also got that support benefit in it too. Or you could lock someone down if you make it stride. Just keep them keep them pinned between your magus and your fighter. All right, shatter mind. Uh, 15 foot cone for two actions basic will save you telepathically assail the minds of your foes you deal mental damage equal to 2d4 plus your spellcasting ability modifier to all enemies in the area with a basic will save heightened increases the damage by 1d4 when you amp it up you increase the area of the spell um, to your choice of either a 30 foot cone or a 60 foot cone and the damage dice um for the spell changes to D10s. Creatures that fail are stupefied one until the start of your next turn. Or stupefied two on a critical failure. <clears throat> okay, it says all your foes. I was like, wait a minute. Does this mean you can't... You have to be careful of allies? Because it's giving you that option of the two cones. So, yeah. It's a, it's a little uh, mind quake thing going on. So, contagious idea. Two actions... Range is 30 feet, see text. Target is one or two creatures other than yourself, see text. Um, nothing is so contagious as a thought. You place either a pleasant thought or a terrifying one in a creature's mind. 
you can then plant the same thought in a second creature's mind. You can't choose a creature that's already been the target of this casting of Contagious Idea, nor can you choose yourself, as one would expect. Um, the second target can be beyond the range of the spell, but it must be within 30 feet of the first target. So if you do a pleasant thought, the target is soothed, gaining five temporary hit points that last for one minute. With a terrifying thought, the target must make a will save. All of the stuff on this one is will saves, and I like that I like that they did that, because you'd be surprised how many games would not do that. Um, so the target, on a criti critical success, the target is unaffected and temporarily immune for a minute. On a success, the target's frightened one, then immune for a minute. On a failure, they're frightened two. On a critical failure, they're frightened three. If they fail, you can just keep contagious idea, 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 ing, I contagious idea, ing. Um, <laughs> to keep them frightened. Um, and you heighten one. The temporary hit points for the pleasant thought are increased by one. You amp it up. You can choose to spread the thought from a second target to a third target in the same manner as spreading it from the first target to the second. A pleasant thought grants twice the temporary hit points, ten plus two additional out per for each height level. Yeah, I that's awesome. Again, like it's just it on the surface, it's very simple because you're just scaring people with your mind powers. But it's like that's what you want to do as a psychic. Honestly, that's like the exact flavor you want for a telepathic, heavy telepathic psychic. So it's very very neat. Okay, this is the one I'm excited about because I've mentioned the Magus a couple times and I I consider myself a Magus main and for my like main build I'm probably going to multi-class the Psychic just to get this. So, let's get into it. So, Tangible Dream. You pull colors and shapes from the depth of your mind projecting impossible creations into the world as tapestries of astral thread or sculptures of force and light. So your granted spells are Color Spray, Mirror Image, Sea of Thought, which is new, Resilient Sphere, Etheric Cor Shards, which is new, Blade Barrier, Project Image, Scintillating Pattern, and Prismatic Sphere. By the way, Color Spray, even in 2nd Edition Pathfinder, still really good at low levels. <laughs> um, just throwing that random thought out there. Uh, your standard side cantrips are Dancing Lights and Shield. And your unique side cantrips are Imaginary Weapon, Astral Rain, and Hologram Cage. So, Dancing Lights. Um, they can float wherever you like. After you after creating the lights, they can move more than 10 feet from other lights and more than 120 feet from you. You can amp it up like this. Your lights whirl together, dazzling and hypnotically. When you amp the spell, you create a flashing display comprised of all four lights in an unoccupied five-foot square. If you move the lights when you sustain the spell, the lights must remain together. The spell gains the visual trait. Each creature in a five-foot emanation around the lights when you cast the spell must attempt a fortitude save. On a success, they're dazzled until the start of your next turn and then becomes temporarily immune for a minute. If they fail... The creature is dazzled until the start of your turn and must attempt a new save against the spell whenever it starts its turn adjacent to the lights. Um, if they critically fail, they're fascinated by the lights. So you make the sparklies and creatures can be very, very enraptured with them. Um, that's all right. This is what I'm more excited for is shield and an imaginary weapon. So the enhancement for shield. Um, your shield spell can, de can be deployed on behalf of others. When you cast shield, you choose a target ally within 30 feet to gain the benefits of the spell instead of you. Optionally. You can still put it on you, of course. Um, the option to shield block with the spell is up to you and uses your reaction, not the targets. Your shield also gains the following amp. You create a layered barrier of three shields to improve your defenses. The duration increases to sustained up to one minute instead of start of your next turn. 
The shield still lowers at the start of each of your turns, but you can raise it again with um, sustain the spell. When you shield block with this spell, one of the three layers breaks and you cease to gain the bonus to AC, but the spell doesn't end. You can keep using the spell until the final layer breaks. Once it does, the spell ends and you can't cast shield or amp shield again for 10 minutes. You can choose to break additional layers when you shield block with the spell to improve your defenses. If you break two layers instead of one, you increase the hardness to one and a half times the normal amount. So seven at first level, 15 at third level, 22 at fifth level, 30 at seventh, and 37 at ninth. If you break all three layers, increase the hardness to double the normal amount. I'm looking to main a sparkling targe magus. So having an amped up shield is just, mm, sounds so good. Yeah, of course, Magus, you have to deal with the action economy of sustaining a spell. But every other turn is kind of a gap turn. Because you're going to want a spell strike, maintenance turn, spell strike turn, maintenance turn, and on and on. So on that off turn, I actually think having the shield spell sustained is not that bad. Um, now... And of course, if you emergency tars, you can cast shield, and amping is just amping, so you can, I would think, emergency tars to cast that shield, blow the focus point, you get your layered shield out of it. So, you have your tactical options on how to deploy that. But this is the real reason why I'm looking at taking this as a magus. So, imaginary weapon. Magus would get this at level 6, by the way. Uh, we'll hit the we'll hit the archetype up after I get through the class. So imaginary weapon. I will point out it does have the attack tag in here, so you can spell strike it. Two actions: range, touch, target one creature. You create a simple weapon of force. Make a melee spell attack roll against your target's AC. If you hit, you deal your choice of bludgeoning or slashing damage equal to one d8 plus your casting ability modifier. On critical success, you deal double damage and can choose to detonate your weapon to push the target 10 feet away from you. The heightened is, add a d8, when you amp it, you form multiple force weapons to lash out at multiple foes. Make two imaginary weapon strikes, each against a different target. Your map doesn't increase until you've made both strikes. Amped plus one, the damage increases by 2d8 instead of 1d8. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh spell striking with us. Um uh it it seems good. Um it seems like a good cantrip to have. Uh and then you can amp it for even more damage. And you know, mages are gonna have a focus spell already, so you can maybe do it twice per combat if you want. At twelfth level you can put conflux focus and get both of those back when you refocus. Um at 8th level, you can get Spell Swipe, so you can actually use the double hit from the amp. Yeah, it's like the perfect mage's ability, not on the mages. And in my mind, because I'm such a big Karian Knight fan, I see this as like a Karian Slicer or Karian Greatsword, right? Because we can have a Force-created Greatsword doing the swing for us. So, yeah, it's like... I absolutely want to pick that up with my favorite class. I might as well go for that cantrip. Um, and yeah, Magus is really, really... Uh, what's the word? Pliable when it comes to feats. Uh, not a lot of the feats in the class itself give you huge advantages. So at 2 and 6, Sparkling Targe doesn't really need to pick anything up. We want that at 4, the Emergency Targe. So yeah, it lines up pretty pretty neatly with what I want to build. And then spell swipe at 8, and then do whatever beyond that. But uh, for the Psychic, that's actually not as good, because it's a melee attack. And you're, you're boasting that whopping D6... Uh, well, not D6. Whopping plus 6 hit points per level. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, riskier... Riskier for the psychic. Actually, actually, when we get to feats, we'll see why it's not as risky when we get to feats. 
But anyways, um, the next hand trip is Astral Rain. Two actions, range 60 feet. Area is a 5-foot cube. Reflex saving throw. You fling a mass of furious thoughts into the air where they expand into numerous blades or other shapes that rain down. Any creature that's in the area or enters the area before the start of your next turn takes your choice of bludgeoning or piercing damage equal to 2d4 plus your spellcasting modifier with a basic reflex save. Heightened plus one increases the damage by d4 and you amp it up. The area changes to a five foot burst and you can sustain the spell for a minute. The first time each round that you sustain the spell, you can move the burst up to 20 feet. Seems like a standard blastery thing. Make a little psychic blade storm, I guess. And then you can just have it like move around. Um, <clears throat> so next is... A hologram cage. Three actions. Range 60 feet. One cube, 20 feet on each side. The duration is one minute. You weave light into a cube of vivid and fantastic patterns. The walls shed bright light for 10 feet, dim light for the next 20 feet, and completely block line of sight. Creatures within the cage can't be seen by creatures outside it, though they can see each other. Um, and creatures outside can't see into it. Um, you can dismiss the spell, and if you cast the spell again, your previous um, hologram cage ends. So, box of light. Um... I'm guessing everyone can freely move through it, but yeah, getting a box of light's not bad for stopping like ranged attacks and stuff. Um, so heightened level seven, the range of the spell increases to 80 feet and you can expand the cube to 25 feet on each side. Amping it up, force walls make the cage's barrier physical as well as visual. Each 10 by 10 foot section of the cage's wall has 10 AC. Hardness equal to double the spell's level, and HP equal to quadruple the spell's level. The spell is disrupted by any, um, if any of its walls pass through a creature when you cast it. Hmm. A cantrip wall of force. That's pretty delicious, actually. <laughs> uh, all right, last uh, conscious mind is the unbound step. It's a teleporty one. So you get thoughtful gifts. Enlarge, Rally Point, Dimension Door, Strange Geometry, Collective Transposition, Momentary Recovery, Maze, and Bilocation. Uh, your cantrips are Phase Bolt and Warp Step, which are two new ones for this book. Um, and then you have Distortion Lens, Ghostly Shift, and Tesseract Tunnel as your more advanced cantrips. So Phase Bolt... I guess I should go to it first, huh? Um, so we're on page 24. Let's go to 106. Bah. So phase bolts. Uh, here we go. So it's two actions, 30 feet, target a creature. You point your finger and project a bolt of magical energy that stutters in and out of phase until it reaches the target. <clears throat> Make a ranged spell attack against your target's AC. Target has any circumstance bonuses to AC such as from a shield or cover. Reduce that bonus by two for this attack. Huh. It's arcane too. Mm. Uh, on success you deal 1d4. Piercing damage plus your spell casting ability modifier. On critical success the target takes double damage. You heighten it. It increases by 1d4. Hmm. Got a nice mental railgun there. And then the other cantrip is Warp Step. It's also arcane. Um, when you walk, the earth warps beneath your feet. Your steps extend. Distance contracts. And everything is just a little bit closer. You gain a five-foot status bonus to your speed until the end of your turn. Then, you then try twice. Uh, you can use Warp... Oh, you can use warp step with burrow, climb, fly, and swim. Okay. So warp step. Warp step is a uh, kind of a cantrippy long strider. Phase bolt is mental magic missile, I guess, but not magic missile because it doesn't auto hit. It is on the arcane spellcasting list, though. Just putting that out there. 
Okay, so uh, for the Psychic, though, your phase bolt temporarily sends the target's cover out of phase if it hits. On a success, reduce the target's circumstance bonus to AC, if any, by one until the beginning of your next turn. Interesting. Gains the following amp. Your bolt leaves phase completely, becoming visible and intangible until it's already embedded in the target, giving the impression it simply teleported itself into place. The target's flat-footed against the attack. Additionally, the bolt ignores an amount of hardness or resistance to piercing damage equal to half the spell's level. On a critical success, the target can't be affected by teleportation effects until the start of your next turn. And then the height amp is it makes a 2d4 instead of 1d4. Uh, the phase bolt thickens. Again, I'm getting Elden Ring vibes off this because that's basically like that invisible bolt you get um, from uh, from Celia. Uh, and warp step. Um, your warp, uh, you warp space more compactly, granting you a ten foot bonus to your speed instead of five foot bonus when you use warp step. <clears throat> uh, it also gains falling amp. Space contracts with hardly any thought, letting you cast the spell as a single action. So you amp it up. You basically can move twenty additional feet. Hmm. That's basically a third movement action. All for one action. Uh, and then uh, the Amped Heighten at 4th level. Uh, you twist space so completely, you don't need to travel the interposing distance. Uh, you can choose to instead teleport to a space within your line of sight, line of effect with a range equal to double your speed after applying the status bonuses from Warp Step. Spell gains the teleport trait. That's awesome. I love cantrip teleports. They're, I, I think they took it out. But in first edition, you had dimensional steps for conjurer wizards, which was awesome. Feels like that's basically that. All right. Uh, and then your other cantrips. You got distortion lens. You create a magical lens that distorts space as best suits you. You create the lens in a space within... Oh, yeah. 30 feet, uh, single action, one five-foot square, sustained up to a minute. Um, you create a lens in a space in range, even suspended in midair. If you or an ally's ranged attack passes through the lens, the attack gains an additional 10 feet of range. If an enemy's ranged attack would pass through the lens, it requires an additional 10 foot of range to move through. Though the enemy knows before using its ability whether the interference puts the target out of range. An ally whose space overlaps with the lens can increase the range of its attacks. But an enemy whose space overlaps with the lens can... Doesn't re okay, so your allies, if the ally is in the lens, they still get the bonus, but enemies don't get the penalty. Uh, the first time each round you sustain a spell, you can choose to relocate it to another uh, square within range. Lens disappears if you cast distortion lens again. Heightened plus three. The lens increases or decreases the range um, by five feet. An additional five feet. Uh, you amp it up. It interferes with the creatures as well as attacks. Once during a medium or smaller allies move action, the ally can move into and out of the lens square without the square counting as the total distance moved. Conversely, the lens is difficult terrain for your enemies. Isn't that an ability in, like, League of Legends? Like, isn't that Jace's ability? Like, he has that, that phase wall he puts up? I mean, I know it's an ability in... Uh, games just to have like the enhancement lens thrown out and then you can shoot projectiles through it and they gain effects that's pretty neat um, ghostly shifts uh, single action range 30 feet target one creature sustained up to a minute your body becomes insubstantial as you partially phase out you gain resistance 2 to all damage except force heightened plus 2 the resistance increases by 1 that's pretty good actually uh you're in uh, and you amp it up um your insubstantiality your invisibility -ness is complete enough that you can pass through other creatures causing painful interference effects when you do so once each round when you stride burrow swim or fly you can pass through one creature's space during that action without needing to attempt a check to tumble through though you can't end your turn in its space when you pass through a creature space in this way, you deal 2d6 force damage to a creature with a basic fortitude save. 
Mutiny Amped, heightened, plus two, increases the damage dealt by phasing through a creature by a d6. Yeah, it's a ghost blink. Pretty neat. Uh, Dangerous, though. Because remember, you're still a psychic. Again, you only got a d6. I keep saying d6 like you roll your hit points in this game. You've only got that six to work with. You gotta be a little careful when doing this. Um, I could see it being fun on escape, though. <laughs> like, you you have the guys coming in and they're coming up to you. Like, they got past your, your front line or whatever. And you're like, ghost shift. And then you go through them with your movement. Um, so that could be a fun defensive maneuver. Rather than an aggressive one. So, uh, Tesseract Tunnel. Uh, two actions. Sustain up to a minute. You race from point to point, tearing open tearing open a tunnel in space. You create a portal in your current space, then stride, creating another portal in the space you end your stride. Until the beginning of your next turn, any creature that enters the first portal can immediately transport itself to the exit portal as part of its move action, which adds the teleportation trait to its movement. You can only have one test rack tunnel open at any time. Creating another causes the first to immediately close. You can use the test rack tunnel while burrowing, climbing, swimming, or flying instead of striding if you have the corresponding movement type. Uh, the amp, the physical movement is no longer necessary to connect the two points in space. When you cast test rack tunnel, you simply create a tunnel that ends in a square within range equal to your speed. You can choose to immediately teleport to the space at the far end of the tunnel. Furthermore, the tunnel can be traversed by both in both directions instead of only one. Oh, it's a one-way tunnel. Um, normally. Finally, the duration is now a minute. Um, and you can dismiss this ball. That's really cool. Uh, you see that in video games a lot. Where you have the, you know, the wire movement in like, I think it was Risk of Rain had something like that. I'm sure it's another thing. So that was just the immediate one that popped to mind. Um... But yeah, it's a dimension door that anyone can use. I could see a lot of value in using this for escapes. Setting up a flank. A little surprise action. Enemies behind cover, you open your Tesseract tunnel. Instantly warp behind them. Yeah, really fun tactical ability there. Uh, and that's... Okay, we have the feats to go through still, but I really need to use the restroom. So I'm going to use the restroom. Um, but yeah, I would say, I would say my favorite personal favorite is tangible dream. Like I said, it's, it's got the stuff I want for the things that I play. And I would also say, I really like the, I really like the grasping, um, the distant grasp. Because the enhanced mage hand just sounds like it's a really fun tactical spell. You get the damage bonus on telekinetic projectile. You get some AOE damage with the rend. And then you get that vector screen to neo yourself through a projectile encounter. So yeah, I like that one a lot too. Um, so yeah, uh, we are going to do the psychic feats in a moment. I'll be right back.
Okay. Back. Psychic feats. Let's go over them. So, uh... I I guess I'll just read the feat. <laughs> Give a little little thought if I think it's something interesting. So, uh, as a spellcaster, the psychic does not get to pick a feat at first level. But you have a small set of them because of the human's general... No. Natural ambition. Uh, where they can... Uh, pick a first level feat from a class. So... We have Ancestral Mind. Um, by unraveling memories and connections passed down from your progenitors and buried with your unconscious mind, you learn to convert your inherent magic into psychic power. You can cast any innate spells you know from your ancestry feet or heritage using your psychic spellcasting components. When you do so, the spell's tradition becomes occult, if it wasn't already. And you can use your uh, psychic spellcasting ability modifier instead of charisma to determine your spell attack roll and spell DC. Yeah, so this is a little tweak to, like, your innate casting. So, like, uh, elves, by example, can start with otherworldly magic, where they get a cantrip. Uh, this would let you just include this in your psychic spells instead of having it be its own little thing. Uh, and that just happens with all of your magic you get from your ancestry. So, counterthought... It's a reaction. The trigger is a creature casts a spell with the mental trait. Requirements. You have an unexpended spell slot you could use to cast a spell with the mental trait. Uh, when a foe casts a spell that has the mental trait and you can see its manifestations, you can use your own mental magic to disrupt it. You expend one of your spell slots to counter the triggering creature's casting of the spell with the mental trait. You lose your spell slot as you cast the triggering spell um, the spell slot must be of one for which you could cast a spell with the mental trait. Um, you can then attempt to counteract the triggering spell. So you get a mental counter spell. <clears throat> this is probably a little easier to use than counter spell. Because I think counter spell still requires you to have the spell. At least initially. And then you have that like advanced counter spell feat later on that lets you just counter off of type. I don't use counter spell. Not going to lie. Uh, I've never thought to pick it up because it's a lot like the first edition counter spell where it's eh. Um, but this seems a little better, though it does have that mental trait restriction. So, uh, mental buffer. Your mind deflects an amount of harm from attacks that induce pain or manipulate your mind directly. You gain resistance to mental damage equal to half your level, minimum one. This resistance is increased equal to your level while your psyche is unleashed. A little mental protect little mental damage protection as you would expect a psychic to have. Uh, psychic rapport. Your telepathic sensitivity intensifies when you're affected by mental magic, making it easier for you to link to other creatures. After you cast a spell with the mental trait until the start of your next turn, you gain a plus one circumstance bonus to deception, diplomacy, and intimidation checks, and to perception checks to sense motive. Uh yep. That's actually pretty good for the charisma side of things, because just free plus one to your uh, your social skills there. Second level feats, we have cantrip expansion. You get two cantrips, standard for spellcasters. Um, <clears throat> mental balm. Uh, your spells release soothing mental waves. When this amp, when you or okay, uh, use this amp <laughs> in place of your side cantrip's normal amp entry. You can use this amp. Only on a side cantrip that targets or affects you or one or more of your allies and doesn't target or affect any enemies. So the amp is you or one ally within 30 feet gains a plus two status bonus to will saves against emotional effects for one minute. You can also have the amped side cantrip attempt to counteract one effect imposing the frightened condition on yourself or the chosen ally or an effect imposing the stupefy condition that has a duration of one hour or less. Interesting. Um, if you successfully counteract the effect, you remove only the frightened or stupid. Oh, not any other part of the effect. Okay, they put that in there because my brain immediately went to uh, using a cantrip, an amped cantrip, to undo the effects of unleashing your psyche. So, yeah. Um, 
you can get rid of the stupefied, but I think you're still restricted by the two round thing. Um, Cyburst, uh, we have a mind shift here, so you can take and make this damage mental if you want. So for one action, with a passing thought, you direct violent psychic energies at a nearby creature. One target creature in 30 feet, uh, target one creature in 30 feet, it takes 1d4 bludgeoning damage with a reflex save. At third levels and every two levels thereafter, the damage increases by a 1d4. This is effectively psychic magic missile. Um, with a save. Like, it, it just lets you deal damage. Um, you're not casting a spell. It's not a cantrip. You just think about it and deal some damage. Uh, it's more or less, on like, there's a basic reflex save that avoids it. But it's like, you're not targeting AC or anything. So it's just free damage uh, that you can attempt. All right, warp space. So this is the thing that I said that a um, tangible dream psychic might be able to use with their imaginary weapon to make it safer. So you use your magic to bend space, causing your spell to strike from a strange vector. Use this amp in place of the Psy Cantrip's normal amp entry. The amp side cantrip must have a range. Frick. What was the range on that? I might actually be wrong on that. <clears throat> oh, range of touch. Okay, it has a range. We're good. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, warp space. Uh, there it is. Um, so you trade out that amp that increases the damage and gives you two targets, and you would get something like this. Choose a square within 30 feet to which you have a line of sight, or uh, a line of effect and line of sight. Determine your spell's line of effect and line of sight from there, as well as whether creatures have cover against the spell. The spell can exceed its normal range as measured from you, so long as it's within its normal range from the square you choose. So this is kind of how you could do an imaginary weapon and make it safer. Because um, you can just have it be that weapon just appears 30 feet from you and whacks someone in the back of the head. Uh... Again, it's a good tact it's like a, a good tactical feat if you're into that sort of thing. So Astral Tether, one action. Oh, we're up to fourth level now. So yeah, the first and second level feats are kind of pooled together for your second level feat option. So fourth level feats. Astral Tether. One action. You spin out a thread of psychic energy that connects you to an ally, using it as a conduit for your abilities. Choose a willing creature within sixty feet and connect to it. Whenever you would gain a benefit from a psychic amp, you can have the amp effect the tethered creature instead. You can do so only if the amp grants a distinct benefit, not if it alters the amp spell. The tether can't be severed physically, but breaks if the distance between you and the tethered ally exceeds 60 feet, or if you come unconscious, or if you use astral tether again. So a little bit of uh, helping you with some support stuff with like... Oh... What cantrip were you use that with? Maybe one of those amps that grants temporary hit points or something. Oh, that, uh, can you do it with the amp or with the spell that makes you intangible? Uh, no, ghostly shift already targets a creature. Uh, oh, no, wait. The, uh, yeah, so you can give this amp right here to another creature. That's where Ghostly Shift could probably be okay. This very specifically says your insubstantiability is complete enough that you can pass through other creatures, even though it targets a creature. Wait, why does it target a creature? But it's using you, your. Mm. <laughs> uh... I'm sure there's a cantrip that slipped out of my brain during all this that you could use that with that's super effective. <clears throat> so, homing beacon. Uh, as your spell strikes a target, you plant a beacon in the target's mind that announces its presence to those nearby. Use this amp in place of the side cantrip's amp entry. The amp cantrip must be one that has one or more targets and must either require a spell attack roll or a saving throw. Imaginary weapon. Um, so the amp is, choose one creature hit by the spell. The spell has a spell attack roll or fails its save against the spell if it has a if it requires a save. Um, a psychic beacon emits from the creature's location, making it easier to notice the creature 
is the mind and attention of onlookers is subtly drawn to it. For one minute, if the target would be invisible, it's instead merely concealed. If it would be concealed, it's no longer concealed. <laughs> I'm revealing you with my mind powers. All right, Psy Strikes, free action. Once per turn. Requirements. Your most recent action was to cast the spell or to unleash your psyche. You siphon residual psychic energies from your spell into one weapon you're wielding or one of your unarmed attacks. And when you unleash your mind, the energy, the energies flare to match. The attack deals an extra 1d6 force damage. Oh, it's mind shift, so force or mental. Um, until the end of your current turn. Um, if your psyche is unleashed, this benefit instead lasts until your psyche subsides. So this is a B spell weapon, but for force or mental damage which is pretty neat. Add a little mind power to your weapon. Uh, thought form summoning. Uh, you can create a prototypical creature from the depths of your, of your imagination instead of calling one from elsewhere. Whenever you summon a creature, you can choose to instead create a psychic construct of that creature. This grants it resistance to physical damage equal to half its level, Weakness 5 to force and mental damage, and the ability to pass through spaces without needing to tumble through, though it can't end its turn in the occupied space. Mind creatures. Um, I'm surprised that's not considered meta magic. It's just your summons can just be thought summons if you want them to be. No extra... Well, I guess it summons are three action... Or three, uh, yeah, three action abilities. It's like, can't really add an action to that unless it's a freebie. And in that case, it'd just be pointlessly making it a free action. Anyways, um, <clears throat> Violent Unleash. It's a free action. Uh, trigger, you unleash your psyche. The force of your mind unleashing itself racks your enemies with a violent shockwave. You deal 2d6 force damage to all creatures and a 20-foot emanation with a basic reflex save. This explosion is taxing, making you stunned one. Um, at fifth level, and every two levels thereafter, the damage increases by 1d6. It very specifically says all creatures. So if you unleash your psyche and do a violent unleash, your brain power will hurt your allies that are nearby. Um, still, though, that's that's fun to just have your, your psyche unleash, and it's a, a shockwave of, of mental damage. Um... Well, force damage or mental damage. It's a mind shift. So, six level feats. Inertial barrier. Uh, your spell leaves behind barriers that reduce shock and motion. Use this amp in place of a Psy Cantrip's normal amp entry. You, or one target creature of the spell, gains resistance to physical damage equal to two plus the spell's level until the start of your next turn. That's not bad. That's like a stone skin when you amp up your spells. At 6th level, that's what? 2 heightens? Correct? So it's a 3rd level spell? Yeah, I could... Might be a 2nd level spell. But yeah, I could see that being pretty good for your... Like, more supporty psychics. They're amazing. Maybe using the, the telepathic abilities. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, It's just a solid little, solid little amp option there. Um, let's see. So parallel breakthrough. Um, you expand your mind beyond your area of psychic specialty. You gain the first a first level psy cantrip for a conscious mind other than your own. This can either be the unique surface cantrip or one of the common cantrips and the accompanying amp. If you choose a common cantrip, you also gain the special benefit granted by that conscious mind when casting the cantrip without an amp. You don't gain any benefits of the conscious mind, such as additional... Oh, that's cool. Hey, uh, Gnome Jodas. Correct pronunciation. Uh, welcome to the stream. This is second edition. We are going over the Psychic and the Thaumaturge. Uh, we're currently in the six level feats for the Psychic. Uh, we've gone over the class, the unconscious and conscious minds. And then... Uh, we're going to go over Thaumaturge next, I think. Probably going to take a breather and pop a Ricolo before we do that. But yeah. Um, Parallel Breakthrough, uh, that's a solid 
thing that can show up in most classes where you get, you know, the the abilities you don't normal like you don't get from another uh uh, d- uh domain or bloodline. Same thing, but for your mind powers. Okay, sixth sense. If this wasn't at level six, I'd actually point it out and be pissed. Um, but it's at sixth level, so it actually is uh completely fine. All right, so uh, your psychic abilities also allow you to detect the lingering thoughts of spirits and similar entities. While you're exploring but not searching, the GM rolls a secret check for you to find haunts that usually require searching, as well as spirits, creatures on the ethereal plane, and beings made entirely of spiritual essence, such as celestials, fiends, and monitors. You can also potentially notice ethereal creatures and spirits inside solid objects, provided they're within 30 feet of you. This applies while searching, seeking, and on automatic secret check from Sixth Sense. Um, you can still notice spirits only on a successful check. You can't see them if they're more than five feet in sun object. We notice a creature with your Sixth Sense. You also learn its location, making it hidden to you um, if it had been undetected. That's a very story feat. That's the campaign feat. Um... I mean, or if you're dealing with a lot of ghosts, but that that definitely feels like the like we're playing an occult campaign and there's going to be a lot of ghosts. It's a haunted house type of thing. So you pick up six cents to deal with that stuff. <clears throat> Steady spell casting. It's in every caster class. Strain mind. Free action once per hour. Trigger. You cast a side cantrip. Requirements. You have zero focus points. You strain your body beyond its limit to use an amp even when your mental power is depleted. You add an amp effect that costs one focus point to a spell. Instead of paying normal focus point cost, you lose hit points equal to four times the spell level of the amped psychantrip as you bleed from the nose or suffer from some visible sign of strain. Uh, that's really cool. Not only does it give you a, like effectively another focus point, Four times the spell level, though. That could be a lot of damage in the long run. But, you know, if you have temporary hit points from something, you could actually counter that out. Like, um... I was going to say, like, False Life or Vampiric Touch. If you're running that stuff, you can just get rid of those temporary hit points instead. <clears throat> also, I think, wasn't it Ray of Frost with the Oscillating Wave? got temporary hit points so you could probably cancel out that the the hit point loss with doing another amp on it all right eighth level feats brain drain two actions with a rest resting yeah <clears throat> with a resting of will you siphon off a creature's mental energy to replenish your own one non-mindless creature within 30 feet must attempt a will save against your spell dc on a success, the creature's unaffected. On a failure, the creature stupefied one for one minute, and you regain one focus point. Up to your ma- normal maximum. Can't use brain drain again until after the next time you make your daily preparations. On a critical failure, the creature's t- stupefied too. Oh, uh, that's fun. That's a fun way to get your psychic abilities back. Just do a woo 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 And then, like their brain power goes into your like that's just really fun and i like that you can use it over and over again until they fail so you can actually keep attempting to do it if you really want that focus point back um or if you you can try it against different things until you get that focus point back it's a nice little detail there so dark persona's presence free action you unleash your psyche when you unleash your psyche all your rage and pain the portion of your psyche dedicated to cruel retribution uh come along with it Uh, unleash that inner edge lord the force of your dark persona's negativity batters constantly against all creatures um in a 30-foot emanation when you unleash your psyche for as long as your psyche is unleashed uh, so 30 foot emanation while your psyche is up. You have an aura of I'm a super edge lord. Oh yeah. Um, 
A creature must attempt a will save against your spell DC the first time it enters the emanation, or if it's in the emanation when you take this action, it doesn't need to make the save again, even if it leaves the emanation and returns. A creature frightened by your dark persona's presence can't decrease its frightened value below one while within the emanation. So if they critically succeed, they're unaffected. Oh, this includes your allies too. I just realized it says creature. <laughs> um, on a success... Oh, there's... So even if they succeed at the save, they're still frightened one. On a failure, they're frightened two. Crit failure, they're frightened three. While your psyche's unleashed, your dark persona cares only for destruction. You can cast a spell only if it directly damages an enemy or object and can impose a death or an Okay, so you can only use um, offensive offensive magic while your super edgelord persona is out. Um... <clears throat> So we have mental static. It's a reaction. You roll a critical success on a will save against a mental effect from a creature. Your thoughts sting back when a lesser mind tries to invade your own. You deal mental damage equal to your level to the triggering creature. If you so desire, you can also send the creature a single mental image to coincide with the damage, such as a watchful eye um, or the dread of floating in an infant. I, I know the image I would send to them. Anyone want to guess? If you guessed middle finger, you are correct. Okay, remove presence. Um, your spell reaches into the mind of a creature and removes you from it. The amped cantrip must be one that has one or more targets. Must either require a spell attack roll or have a saving throw. Use this amp in place of the side cantrip's normal amp. So, choose one c target of the spell or one creature in its area. If the, cre if the enemy... It actually says enemy. Fails its save or the spell hits it. You become undetected by the creature, disappearing from its senses for one minute or until you use a hostile action. This is similar to being invisible, but effects like scene visibility don't reveal you. You're affecting the target's mind, not its vision. True seeing can still see through this illusion. The counteract check succeeds. That's super fun. Just use your mind powers imaginary weapon a dude and then you're just gone for a minute alright thought sense you can detect the flickers of mental activity let off by all thinking creatures you gain thought sense as a vague sense is a range of 30 feet like all vague senses it's only about as precise as an average human sense of spell meaning you generally can predict only if a creature is present your thought sense detects only thinking creatures, so a creature that is unthinking or otherwise immune to mental effects, such as many constructs and oozes, can't be perceived using your thought sense, regardless of how precise it is. When you unleash your psyche, when your psyche is unleashed, your thought sense upgrades to an imprecise sense, letting you seek out creatures. Not bad. Telepathic radar. Uh, whispering steps. Your spell leaves a lingering connection between you and a creature. One through which you can nudge the creature's mind this way or that. The amped cantrip must take two or more actions to cast, target one or more creatures, and either require a spell attack roll or a saving throw. Use this amp in place of the normal amp. So choose one enemy who is the target of the spell. If that enemy fails its save or the spell hits it, you whisper in the creature's mind, forcing it to step in a direction of your choosing. This is a forced movement can't force the target to step into hazardous terrain off the ledge or the like after it steps the creature could that's really lame <laughs> i'm sorry but that's with all of the stuff you can get that can just knock people knock creatures around and shove them and stuff like that should just let them step wherever you want them to step yeah i I understand that it does have tactical uses to be able to walk someone away from you or away from an ally or towards a flanking area, but honestly, I would rather have it be a bit more like, I'm just going to walk this dude off a cliff. Yeah, it's going to take three turns to get there, but I'm going to do it. Watch. And then do it. Oh, yeah. Compared to... There's one thing that's going to come up at 18th level, and... Yeah, Whispering Steps is only 8th level, but the thing you get at 18th level is brutal as hell. So it's like, this is like, it's very, very, let's say, flaccid compared to what else you can do with the Psychic. So, uh, at 10th level, there are four feats related to the subconscious mind. Um, so, 
And then signature spell expansion, you get two more signature spells. But yeah, uh, I think that's it. Yeah. So 10th level, you get to have like your your feats that give you your specific choices for your subconscious mind. This is where you get your like advanced thing for that. So dream guys, and they're all one action. Just so I don't have to say it's one action. <laughs> uh, wandering reverie. <clears throat> um, you stride into a willing ally's space. At which point, both of you, both of your appearances shift into a shared third appearance, usually one that looks like a mix of the two of you. Then, either you or your ally steps. You each maintain the merged appearance. Creatures who are observing this know what happened, but still must seek or otherwise engage the illusion to attempt to disbelieve it or determine which of you is which. Otherwise, they can't tell the difference and have equal chance to target e um, each of you. DC 11 flat check. This illusion ends as soon as either you or your ally um, you're merged with acts. So it's kind of a... How would I use this? Is the question. Because I could see using it defensively. Like, let's say the paladin is with you and you're like, oh, I'm going to get hit by something. And you're like... Whoop with the paladin so now there's a fit like that 50 50 shot of either you getting hit and the paladin can obviously take the hit better um yeah i don't know maybe it's it could also be used for some rp purposes like two people are being searched for you and like a rogue and then you phase with the rogue and then you're a third person that could work it's a weird one, but it's it's still pretty cool. Uh, emotional surge for the emotional acceptance subconscious mind. Uh, your heart soars, increasing your power for a moment. You gain a plus two status bonus to attack rolls and skill checks until the start of your next turn. Solidly good plus two bonus there. Impose order, precise discipline. You bring discipline to your mind and magic, ensuring that you don't underperform. Until the end of your turn, instead of rolling dice for damage, count each die as average damage rounded up. 3 for a d4, 4 for a d6, 5 for a d8, 6 for a d10, 7 for a d12. That's really fun. Um, yeah, actually, that that is really fun. Hmm... I think I would definitely pick that up if I were playing a precise uh, discipline psychic. I I I like that it's above average, so you know you're getting a little more than average with your damage. Yeah, definitely enjoy that. Um, so scour the library, gather lore. Seeing an enemy's attack, you quickly consult multiple scraps of lore in your mind, synthesizing them into the perfect plan. Make a check to recall knowledge using the appropriate skill about one creature within 60 feet. On success, in addition to the normal benefits, you get a plus one circumstance bonus to your next attack roll against that creature and to your AC against the creature's next attack. On critical success, these are plus two. Again, solid little buff to yourself. It's based on the flavor of your character. All right, 12th level. We have <clears throat> three feats, one of which has the best feat name ever. <laughs> so we have Foreseen Failure, free action, once per day. A spell you cast has no effect because you critically failed all your spell attack rolls or because all targets critically succeeded their saving throws. You see your spell fail to take hold to, dis to disastrous end. Then you snap back to reality. It was all a precognition. You know to try a different spell. Your spell is expended, but you can cast a spell that requires the same number of actions as the triggering spell or fewer to cast. The second spell must be a different spell than the first. <laughs> um, I don't think that's how precognition works technically, but you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we have a... Uh, no! A reaction... The trigger is a non-minion ally within 60 feet is reduced to zero hit points. 
the shock of seeing your ally near death breaks whatever limits exist in your mind, sending your power spilling forth. If your psyche is currently unleashed, you can immediately use a psyche action that takes one action or less to use. If your psyche is not currently unleashed, you unleash your psyche, which means unleashed until the start of your next or end of your next turn. You can ignore unleash psyche's requirement for, of needing to cast a spell on your previous turn, but you still can't unleash your psyche if you're stupefied or for two rounds after your psyche subsides. Yeah, get a power boost when you see an ally go down. And we have psy catastrophe. Um, you know, I actually haven't pointed it out, but there are psyche things in here. Um, because I, I haven't been actually reading the tags. So, like, so, like, um, yeah, the cyburst thing up here, you have to have your psyche unleashed to use it. You can't just freely do that. It's a psyche-related burst of, of damage. Same thing with brain drain. You need psyche to actually use it. That also means if you're multiclassing from something that uses focus points, you can't use brain drain. Um, and then, yeah, these four things here have the psyche tag. So the, the, the Psyche tag and Psy Catastrophe, it's all over the place, um, which is what you get with No, is you can reaction use one of these abilities. <clears throat> so, know, so know that you have to have Psyche actions in order to really take advantage of No! Um, so yeah, Psy Catastrophe, two actions. You stop holding back your power, unleashing it all in a catastrophic blast. All creatures, including allies, in a 20-foot emanation take 1d6 bludgeoning damage per level with a basic reflex save. Your psyche subsides as your power is expended. Finishing blast of your psyche. It's a pretty big area, 20 feet around you in an emanation. Uh... 13d6 bludgeoning or mental damage. It's not terrible. Uh, it's got to remember your allies are going to get hit too. 14th level, conscious spell specialization. You become more adept with spells that are always in your mind. Oh, uh, yeah, you gain... No, this isn't a usual thing. Um, so you gain an additional spell slot of the first, second, third, and fourth levels. You can use these spell slots to only cast a spell granted from your conscious mind. At 18th level, you gain an additional 5th level spell slot with the same restrictions. So yeah, um, I mentioned at the beginning of of all of this that the Psychic had two spells per day on their their table, which is basically one less than everything else. Um, this is how you can kind of shore up the lower end of your spells. Uh, it's kind of like, like the breadth archetype things, but in the Psychic class for the Psychic. Um, so deep roots, your mind control spells send burrowing mental roots that tear at your target's mind when they're removed or run their course. When you cast a spell that imposes the controlled condition or otherwise forces the target to take certain actions, such as command, you can choose one target that critically failed its save. When that target finishes fulfilling any commands issued by your spell, or when the spell is dispelled or counteracted, the target takes 1d6 mental damage per level of that spell. Free damage and all your mind control. Just kind of neat. Um, so shatter space. Uh, the sheer power of your magic fractures reality. Use this amp in place of a side cantrip's normal amp. The cantrip must be one that takes two or more actions to cast. So the amp. You or one target of the spell are surrounded by a spiral of torn space. This is an aura and you choose the radius of the emanation up to 20 feet. A creature that starts its turn in the aura or enters the aura during its turn takes 1d6 slashing damage for every level of the amped psi cantrip with a basic reflex save against your spell DC. If the creature critically fails, the torn space throws, off, throws it off balance and it falls prone. The aura lasts until the beginning of your next turn. You can choose whether the aura affects the creature emitting it. So that's cool. You got your tanky thing up front. You cast a beneficial side cantrip on it, amp it up, give them that little whirling mental blades of damage thing, or you can put it on an enemy and the enemy will take the damage too. 
<clears throat> pretty neat. I like that there's that option in there. So, 16th level feats. Almost done <laughs> with this class. So, uh, constant levitation. You get a constant fly. When you unleash your psyche, you get a 10-foot status bonus to your speed. It's pretty awesome, actually, that you're just constantly flying with the power of your mind. So, uh, <laughs> target of psychic ire. Your magic saturates your surroundings with hate full psychic energy. Use this amp in place of Psychantris Amp needs two actions or more. So choose one target of the spell. Psychic phenomena turn themselves on the target. Typically objects fling themselves at the creature. At the beginning of each of the creature's turns, it takes 1d4 bludgeoning damage for each spell level of the Psychantrip this amp was added to with a basic reflex save. The target remains marked by Psychic Ire for three rounds. The effect persists even if you fall unconscious to leave the area. So yeah, free, free damage every turn on your amp, if you choose that. And we have Wandering Thoughts. Uh, this is a psyche one. Free action once per round. You used your most recent action to cast a spell. When your psyche is unleashed, each burst of magic you cast also folds space around you. And you travel through one of those folds. You teleport 15 feet to a square you can see. That's actually really awesome. While your psyche is unleashed, you can teleport around while casting. All right, 18th level. All in your head. Psyche, it's a reaction. You're about to attempt a fortitude save or reflex save. Flames scouring at your body, venom coursing through your veins. You refuse to believe they exist, and nothing can affect you if you don't believe in it. You attempt a will save against a triggering effect instead of a reflex or fortitude save. You don't gain the benefits of Fortress of Will or Walls of Will on the save. So, okay. Huh, what's the advantage of this? So, <clears throat> you don't gain Fortress of Will or Wall of Wills. That's your Master and Legendary to Will save boosts. So you can do an Expert Will save in place of a Reflex save or Fortitude save. While well, your psyche's unleashed. Um, hmm. I kind of wish that let you just do a will save. Because your psyche has to be unleashed to use this. And you're doing an expert will save, correct? But at this point, you're expert in those two other saves. So I don't know that this benefits you enough to pick it up. Maybe it does. Hmm. See, the thing is, I'm reading the very next line for the next feat title, and I'm like, just let's compare and contrast here. Cranial detonation. <clears throat> Free action. Death, mind shift, psyche, psychic. Frequency, once per round. Trigger. You successfully reduce one or more non-mindless enemies to zero hit points with a spell. As your overwhelming psyche fells a creature, you use its flickering consciousness to detonate psychic energy from the creature's head. Each enemy you reduced to zero hit points dies, and its head explodes. It, there's more. Each exploding head, which I honestly never thought I'd read those three words in that series in a Pathfinder book. On like in all honesty, I I don't remember ever reading about exploding heads in previous Pathfinder books. Yet here we are. So each exploding head generates a shock wave in a 15 foot emanation around that enemy. Each creature in any of the emanations takes 10 d6 bludgeoning or mental, damage with a basic reflex save. If this damage reduces an enemy to zero hit points, its head also explodes, potentially damaging more creatures and potentially causing more detonations. A given creature can only take damage once from a single use of cranial detonation. Yeah, that's a... Uh... That's brutal in a hilarious way. It's brutal in like a dark comedy way to me. Where it's just... 
like that's the that's the let's take out the ads with my mind powers out of the gate. Um, you also have Deepest Wellspring, um, which is the if you've spent three focus points, you regain three focus points when you refocus. Um, and this just lets you just completely refocus everything, regardless of how you spent those points. Which is probably the other option at this level, honestly, to me. It if it's like you're not edgy enough to do a cranial detonation, um, then I'd probably go deepest wellspring over all in your head. All right, so twentieth level capstones. We have become thought. Um, so you shed some of your material form, becoming a being of pure thought. This has the following effects: you gain resistance ten to physical damage but weakness 5 to mental damage and weakness 10 to any effect that deals damage by targeting the spirit, such as Spirit Blast. You can change your appearance on a whim. This takes a single action, which has a concentrate trait, has the effects of illusory disguise, and lasts until you change your appearance again. Once per year, when you die, you automatically return to life the next day, as long as one living sentient creature on your plane remembers you. The memories enable you to reconstruct yourself from their thoughts. You appear in the vicinity of that creature that remembers you most strongly. That's kind of both hilarious, fun, and strong. I really like that uh, that ability. It might not be the best because Mind Over Matter exists, which is the next one where you get an additional 10th level spell slot. Um... But yeah, that's still like really cool. Again, Psychic just has really cool things in its ability set. So um, yeah, uh, Mind Over Matter, you get another 10th level spell slot. Uh, Twin Psyche, you double your duration of Unleashed Psyche, which is ho-hum to me. Uh, and Unlimited Potential, uh, one action, this is meta magic. <laughs> Once per minute, the laws of magic can limit your mind only if you think you need them, and you've grown past the need for such limits. If your next action is to cast a spell of 5th level or lower that has no duration, you don't expend the prepared slot as you cast it. So that's a standard thing that spontaneous casters get at 20th level where they can just freely cast their low-level spells. So that's all right, I guess. Um... And that's the Psychic. We made it. Uh, very cool class. Um, I would say, as far as the full casters go, I would probably pick it over a wizard at this point. Um, <clears throat> it's really good at blasting. You still kind of have to deal with the, like... Lower spell attack rolls, I think. Um, but you you get like really strong amps to cantrips, and you can refocus your focus points like two per ten minute refocus, um, provided you're using them for only amping. Um, and even if you're not, you get two focus points out of the gate. That's not something like to shake a stick at. You jump over to another class that uses a lot of focus points. Um, or if you're a focus point class like that utilizes them but maybe doesn't use them a lot, you can jump into this class and get one off the archetype. Oh, yeah, the archetype. Um, down to right here. Uh, <clears throat> so I... Uh, I think it's a really fun class, both to go into and to jump out of. Um, lots of fun abilities in it, too. So, the dedication. Uh, the dedication feat, you need either 14 int or charisma. You choose your subconscious mind. Um, or, sorry, you choose your, your conscious mind. And then you get the one of the two of the regular cantrips. And you get to amp it up. And you get a focus point, and you get training in occultism, or a skill of your choice if you're already trained in it. So you get a skill, you get your cantrip, you get the amp for the cantrip, and a focus point. So a really solid start 
with the dedication at second level. Um, at fourth level, um, you can pick a second, a first or second level psychic feat. That's a standard thing. And then at sixth level, provided you've taken that feat, you can gain one that is um, half of your character level uh, for psychic feats. Again, that's standard. And then the spell casting is also standard. <clears throat> um, so you gain uh, basic spell casting benefits when you gain a spell slot of a new level from the psychic archetype. Add a spell um, of the appropriate level to your repertoire, either a common occult spell, one granted by your conscious mind, or another spell you've learned or discovered. Standard spontaneous multi classing spell casting. There is a typo right here. The master spell casting is at 18th level, not 12th level. Um, and it's the standard layout of 4, 12, 18. Um, the only other feat in here, there's no breath, by the way. So there's no psychic breath. So you can't get the 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1. Um, <clears throat> You have side development. Um, you found a new mental form. You gain another side cantrip from your conscious mind, either the standard cantrip you didn't take with the psychic dedication or the unique surface side cantrip. You gain the benefits and the amp um, for the second side cantrip, and you increase the number of focus points by one. Really good. Like, really, really good. Um, I've I mentioned before, and this will be our sample idea, the Magus is like my favorite class ever. Um, oh, whoop. Uh, 30? 31. I was close. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, a Magus picking up Psychic at 2 and 6. You get your Dedication. You get your second Cantrip. So you get like that boosted shield and an imaginary weapon. Or Phase Bolt. Phase Bolt would be great for the Magus. Just a railgun on the end of your sword. Awesome. Less damage, but awesome because it reduces the failure of that hit um, with its effects. Uh, I'm staring into Mios's eyes right now. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I really do like it as a dedication too because even if you're playing like a wizard or something um, that's already doing spell casting, you can get the amped cantrip and that really would help out a character and you get another focus point then at six you grab another cantrip that you can amp up and you get that third second or third focus point well wizard probably third point um so yeah i i really like the dedication for it too um all right so we are gonna do thaumaturge next i i do think i have the energy and vocal ability for doing that but i'm gonna get a fresh glass of water I'm going to pop a Ricola and sort of like sit back for a tiny bit. And then we're going to pop over to the Thaumaturge. So give me one quick sec to get that water. And then I'll be back. <laughs> 